The ship we're commissioning today is a warship. Her mission, to preserve the peace. On Veterans Day 1981, Vice President George Bush commissioned the USS Ohio, the first Trident submarine. To this day, it is the most fearsome weapon system ever built. The Trident weapon system can rain down thousands of nuclear warheads and wreak destruction that probably threatens the survival of humankind on Earth. We all knew what a weapon of mass destruction that could be. And we never wanted to fire one in anger. Never. We would have lost everything had we done that. There are 18 Trident submarines, each armed with 24 nuclear missiles. Each missile carries eight separate warheads aimed at different targets. Together, they are responsible for roughly half of America's nuclear arsenal. These capabilities will bring sobriety to the mind of any foreign leader who has the inclination to use weapons of mass destruction against ourselves or our allies. The Trident subs are more than 10 times the size of America's World War II submarine. So it's a very big ship. It's four stories tall. It's uh, over 580 feet long, which means if you stood up on end, it'd be as tall as the Washington Monument or, or as tall as the Seattle Space Needle. It displaces over 18,000 tons in the water, which relatively is about the size of a World War II cruiser. The Trident submarine isn't only large, it's believed capable of achieving underwater speeds of close to 30 miles per hour. While speed helps, a submarine lives or dies by how quiet it is. A Trident submarine has never been detected by unfriendly ships. Trident is one of the quietest ships that's ever gone to sea. It is also because of the large, vast expanse of ocean that it can roam in uh, relatively undetectable. Once they disappear at sea, they have disappeared. As large as that Trident submarine is, you have to be within relatively a few miles in the ocean to be able to even have an attempt or opportunity to detect a submarine. In fact, the only time a Trident submarine is vulnerable is when it surfaces to enter and leave port. Otherwise, the 155 crewmen spend most of their roughly 72-day tours hidden underwater on patrol. No one except for those on board knows the exact location of a Trident submarine on patrol. So in total, the Trident system is probably the most impressive, most capable system our Navy has put to sea. The Trident system is a complete weapon, a marriage of submarine and missile that began simply as an idea back in the 1950s. Over the course of the Cold War, that idea would grow into the backbone of America's nuclear arsenal. That's something of a surprise, because the Navy was standing on the sidelines as America's strategic nuclear force first began to develop. In the beginning, the concept of nuclear warfare was an Air Force concept. It was to be bombers, and we were building clouds of bombers. Yet those bombers were becoming increasingly vulnerable. Surface-to-air missiles were being developed that were making it harder and harder for bombers to basically fly over air defenses. And at the other end, uh, bombers lived on uh, big fixed bases that, as uh, Soviet offensive missiles were developed, people became concerned about their vulnerability. The Air Force, however, was determined to dominate America's nuclear arsenal. So it began building ballistic and cruise missiles to go along with its bomber force. With the new missiles, the Air Force got more than half of the nation's total military budget. This did not sit well with the other military services. There was a fear that the Air Force is just going to continue to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and basically eat the rest of the services in, in the Navy in particular. But the Navy was determined to remain relevant. Thanks in large part to Chief of Naval Operations Arlie Burke. Only 54 years old at the time, 
Burke was appointed CNO in 1955 over 92 more senior admirals. Burke was appointed because the undersecretary of the Navy did a poll of senior admirals asking who could be CNO at the time. Burke's name was not at the top of every list, but his name was on every list. Burke wasn't the only admiral getting attention in the mid-1950s. Admiral Hyman Rickover was earning headlines for pioneering the use of nuclear power to drive submarines, the first of which, the USS Nautilus, was launched in 1954. In my opinion, the Nautilus is not simply another new submarine that can travel for practically unlimited distances under the water. I consider that she's a new weapon and that she may have just as profound an effect on naval tactics and strategy as the airplane has had on war. Nuclear propulsion made submarines true submersibles. Before the nuclear plants came along, the submarines had to come to the surface regularly and remain on the surface, be subject to detection and attack. Burke realized that Rickover held the key to the Navy's role in nuclear deterrence. Rickover's nuclear submarine combined with ballistic missiles would put the Navy in the running to build America's nuclear arsenal. Admiral Burke was convinced that marriage of the two, the nuclear-powered submarine and the ballistic missile, would give the country a weapon with considerable strategic deterrent effect, and he was the pusher for it. This was a great idea. You would have this very difficult to locate, near impossible to locate submarine that was always there. It was like checkmate. It was, if you had this at sea, uh, you couldn't be defeated. You may not be able to win, but you certainly couldn't be defeated because the other guy would lose uh, as well. Burke's idea to use nuclear weapons to deter enemies from attacking was very different from that of the Air Force, which wanted to use them as offensive weapons. The Air Force was the bombardment arm of the military, and the nuclear weapons fit their strategy perfectly. And you had zealots uh, who simply wouldn't take no for an answer. We were going to fight with nuclear weapons. We were going to bomb them back into the Stone Age. The Air Force and the Navy views about nuclear weapons were quite different. The Air Force became directed towards the use of nuclear weapons probably to an excessive degree. Undoubtedly, to an excessive degree. The Air Force's view about nuclear weapons stood in stark contrast to that of Admiral Burke and the Navy. Their desire was largely to de-emphasize nuclear weapons in the sense that you, you don't rely on them as a substitute for traditional general purpose forces. You rely on them primarily as a means of deterring their use against you by someone else. What Burke was also looking to was eventually reducing the amount of money the country was going to spend on all nuclear forces so that all the services would be better equipped for contingencies other than general nuclear war. Admiral Burke's vision required combining a new type of submarine with a brand new missile. The program would be called Polaris after the North Star. The Navy and the nation would use Polaris to chart an entirely new course in nuclear warfare. It would be the first step towards the Trident. In the mid-1950s, America's nuclear policy, still in its infancy, began taking shape along with its new weapons. To make the Navy competitive with the Air Force, CNO Arleigh Burke was eager to combine atomic missiles with nuclear submarines. Many of Burke's fellow admirals, however, were much less enthusiastic. The Navy has three unions, has had three unions since before World War II. They have the Surface Warfare Union, they have the Aviation Union, and they have the Submarine Union. Literally, each one is in front of the Chief of Naval Operations demanding more for their service. The Surface and Aviation Wings were nervous about a new big budget submarine program. Even the submariners themselves had little enthusiasm. Submariners are heroes. They are people who like to go out and do these dangerous things. The idea of hiding in a submarine and not 
doing anything except waiting for the time to start the war. It didn't have a lot of appeal to some reason. With most of the Navy skeptical, Admiral Burke didn't trust any existing department to develop his new program. Burke decided that he needed to set up something outside the normal chain of command as an effort to create this new sea-based ballistic missile. He created something that became known as the Special Projects Office and picked a bright, brand new young aviator admiral named Red Rayburn and put him in charge. Don't go, Admiral. Rayburn's Special Projects Office had the backing of the CNO in writing. I gave Admiral Rayburn this letter because there was a lot of opposition within the Navy, too. There, uh, not opposition, there were a lot of differences of opinion. A lot of people thought this cannot be done. There is too much to do. There are too many things that are undeveloped. Everybody in the Navy knew Admiral Rayburn had this memorandum. He carried a copy of it in his po inside coat, coat pocket, wherever he went. He never had to pull it out because everybody knew he had it. Originally, the Navy had decided to join the Army's Jupiter Ballistic Missile Program to modify it for deployment at sea. But Rayborn was skeptical. Now, the Jupiter is a large uh, liquid fuel missile, and we con conducted controlled tests to see if uh, this missile could be used aboard ship, and we were dismayed, actually, with the uh, dangers inherent in large quantities of liquid fuels aboard ship. The inherent problems of volatile liquid fuel rockets in confined spaces of submarines continued to vex the Navy as it met with scientists in the summer of 1956 in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. There, Dr. Edward Teller, father of the hydrogen bomb, promised the Navy he would invent a lighter warhead, which meant that the Navy could then use a missile propelled by solid rather than liquid fuel. Teller's promises, however, were just that, promises. Dr. Harold Brown, a future Secretary of Defense, was a division leader in Dr. Teller's laboratory. I was responsible for developing the nuclear warhead. We had not, in fact, done it. We were sufficiently confident that we could do it, that we could do it in time to meet a 1958-59 schedule. Wasn't so clear, but in the end, we managed to do that. And it was a good thing, because Teller's promises led Burke to end the Navy's joint program with the Army's Jupiter missile, and instead embark on an entirely new course with the Polaris missile. We were put to work to scope out what a, a small solid propellant missile might look like, what a submarine might look like that would carry these missiles. It was probably one of the most exciting and stimulating times in my entire career, no question about it. Nobody needed to be told to come to work in the morning, but people did need to be told to go home at night. This sense of purpose came from the top of the Special Projects Office, its director, Admiral Rayborn. Test vehicles have decisively proven the wisdom of the Navy going to solid propellant type of missiles. We need no technical breakthroughs to assure giving this missile to the arsenal of democracy. Working for him was like working for an evangelist who's, who's so completely convinced that he knows the way ahead uh, for all of us that uh, we didn't really have to think twice about it. He said the rest of the Navy may be at peace, but we're at war. And uh, just to remind everyone of that, I want people in uniform all the time. The Navy and its contractors began to tackle daunting new technologies. But the launch of the Soviet satellite Sputnik in 1957 suddenly changed the political landscape particularly for the Polaris system. Basically, through 1958, 1959, you have this classically American uh, frenzy. Before there have actually been any full-scale tests of the system, people have accepted that Polaris is, is a viable system. Polaris was seen as a way to counter the Soviet ballistic missile program, especially given Khrushchev's then indication, which turned out not really to be true, that they were on the Soviet side turning out missiles like sausages, it had created a certain amount of, of concern in the United States. People in the Congress were very concerned. I think that Eisenhower himself knew better and was not so concerned, but meeting public concerns is often a reason for starting and accelerating weapons programs. Congress gets into this mood where it's essentially impossible to ask them for too much money for these systems. There's nothing more popular than spending money on Polaris. 
With Congress firmly on board, Admiral Rayborn took his message directly to the people. But with a 25 run uh, missile, which will fit right into these submarines. He gave speeches everywhere the possible, size, describing size, what size, the project people. was. And uh, we do it to uh, Kiwanis groups, or we do it to the, uh, the Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, it didn't matter. And he would, at the end of the speech, say, Grab the back of your neck. And everybody in the audience would grab the back of his neck, and he said, That's the neck we're going to save if we build the Polaris program. The Eisenhower administration accelerated the Polaris program by changing the deployment date from 1965 to 1960, a timetable that was next to impossible to meet with a new weapon system. But the Navy pulled it off. Fire control ready. Flight control ready. You have a green light. I've got a green board. Here we go. Twelve, six, five, four, three, two, one. Fire. We were able to get that system deployed in under four years from the time the program was authorized until it was operationally deployed on the USS George Washington, the first ballistic missile submarine. Polaris was an amazing success. There's hardly ever been a weapons program that came into existence in the time frame of the magnitude of the Polaris program. Mr. President, I'm grateful for a lot of things. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have been able to serve in this man's Navy for a long time. In 1961, Admiral in Burke America. retired from the Navy. His Polaris program was well underway. The Polaris missile had been operational for a year, and several submarines were in production. There's nothing more popular than winning this race with the Russians, which of course we discovered we were essentially at that time racing with ourselves because the the, the Russian ICBM program was much less further along than we expected. Yet by this point, Polaris had a momentum of its own. Over the next decade, it would reshape America's nuclear arsenal. Almost as soon as the new Polaris missiles and submarines were deployed in late 1960, the Navy and the incoming Kennedy administration Three, knew they had something two, special. One, fire. Polaris was a unique nuclear weapon system, one that was invulnerable to a Soviet preemptive attack. Polaris is the first system that really introduces the idea of a survivable system, something that even if the opponent wants to attack it, there's no way for him to do it because he doesn't know where it is. I served as the commissioning executive officer of one Polaris missile submarine. They were quiet. Our operations were such that we stayed away from potential detection to the extent we could. We knew we were quieter than just about anything else at sea. We knew we were very, very difficult to find, and we knew that to counter us was nearly impossible. To counter all of us at the same time was just plain impossible. Polaris, also known as the Fleet Ballistic Missile Program, or FBM, was moving ahead at a rapid rate. By March 1961, Kennedy had announced plans for 29 FBM submarines. FBM was always regarded as the very heart of our, of our deterrent in the sense that there was little doubt about its survivability. Or its reliability. The Polaris Fleet Ballistic Missile Submarine, Ethan Allen, assigned as the launch... In 1962, the Polaris submarine USS Ethan Allen launched a missile 1,700 miles and successfully detonated its warhead in what would be the only American test of an ICBM with a live nuclear warhead. Right from the beginning, the Fleet Ballistic Missile Program had strong congressional support, and not only from the members of Congress that had contractors in their districts. It was easily understood. It was an invisible presence so that it didn't uh, it didn't frighten people because it was off in the ocean and its purpose was clear the Air Force which still viewed nuclear weapons as its primary mission began upgrading its bomber fleet as well as developing a new solid fuel ICBM called Minuteman that was even more accurate than the Polaris missile you have this thing emerge which we call the triad and the triad was the, the three legs of our nuclear posture. Polaris, Minuteman, 
which was a solid fuel ICBM that the Air Force developed in response to Polaris, essentially, and what remained of the bomber force. In the triad, nuclear weapons were based in the air on bombers and on land and at sea in the form of ballistic missiles. The term was used to describe the foundation of American nuclear policy. However, the concept of the triad developed almost by accident. The elements of the triad came into being before the doctrine of the triad. There's no question about that. Uh, there was not, we will build these three elements and we will call these three elements the triad. The Navy's decision to go ahead with Polaris, Burke's decision to go ahead with Polaris, was in fact the thing that led to the creation of a triad. Despite Polaris' success, the Navy was reluctant to spend a large part of its budget on it. Polaris's were being pushed on the Navy at a rate where it was greater than they, they were comfortable with. I mean, it was taking up more money within their budget than, than, than uh, even the supporters of the system were, were comfortable with. In 1961, President Kennedy nominated me to be Director of Defense Research and Engineering in charge of research and development. The impression I got was that the Navy was mostly interested in its sea control mission uh, and its conventional force capability mission. The Navy did not push for a very, very large Polaris program as opposed to Air Force ballistic missiles or Air Force bombers. Nevertheless, over the course of the early 1960s, the Polaris missile went through two updates, increasing payload, range, and accuracy. It gave America the great strength of the Polaris missile. In 1965, it President Lyndon Johnson announced another update, which he called Poseidon. I extend my congratulations. By 1967, there would be 41 Polaris-class submarines at sea, nicknamed 41 for freedom. Submerge the ship, make your depth six five feet. Six five feet, I. Keep the watch on the one MC. Dive, dive. Dive, dive. Despite the awesome striking power that the submarines represented, the Pentagon had begun thinking about what nuclear deterrence would look like in ten years. We're going to look at the successors to Polaris and Minuteman, and um, the uh, Defense Department decides to conduct a study. Um, which comes to be called the STRAT-X. The purpose of STRAT-X was to come up with a program that would provide a very high degree of assurance that the U.S. strategic force could survive a very large preemptive attack by the Soviet Union and then retaliate with overwhelming force. STRAT-X considered all the options. In the end, the study determined that an underwater submarine launching system was the most survivable and cost-effective. But the vision was very different from Polaris and Poseidon. There was thought of not using high-powered submarines, but basing things close to the U.S. in protected waters, essentially, and uh, having something that was more than a glorified barge, but considerably less than a very long-range nuclear-powered submarine. Needless to say, the Navy didn't particularly like this. Uh, they don't like to be thought of as barge operators. And that was especially true of Admiral Hyman Rickover. As the father of the nuclear Navy, he was determined that any new submarine be a lot more than an underwater barge. His vision would ultimately come to be called the Trident. Even as 41 missile submarines were serving as America's primary nuclear deterrent in the 1970s, there was growing concern that they might become vulnerable to Russian attack. There was recognition of the ultimate problem of the improvement of Soviet anti-submarine warfare, which might, might ultimately raise a question about the uh, survivability of our boats at sea. Therefore, there was recognition that we had to develop a submarine that would operate at greater distance uh, from the Soviet Union. That would mean that the missiles would have to have a longer range to still hit their targets. 
So the Nixon administration decided to pursue the vision of the Stratac study that called for an underwater long-range missile system dubbed ULMS. ULMS is going to be a much larger missile. And so with a larger missile, you're talking about a larger submarine. There's no way around it. Developing a new submarine drew the instant interest of Admiral Hyman Rickover. Rickover, the man who had 20 years earlier made Polaris possible by developing a nuclear propulsion engine, had already been working on a nuclear reactor design that was quieter and more powerful than the Polaris propulsion system. Admiral Rickover wanted to develop that next generation submarine. It's plain, I think, in retrospect, that the Soviet Union was not advancing as rapidly in terms of anti-submarine warfare that we needed to deploy the Trident that quickly. But there was great pressure from the Hill, some of it generated by Admiral Rickova himself. He really knew how to politic. I'm telling you, this guy watched everything. He knew how to schmooze the Congress. But not everybody agreed with Rickover. Admiral Levering Smith, the engineer who led the technical development of Polaris and Poseidon missiles, headed the Navy's Special Projects Office. That's where the new ULMS missile would be developed. My boss, Admiral Levering Smith, believed that the most important characteristic of the submarine was not its speed, but rather how quiet it would be. Admiral Rickover strongly felt that the new submarine should be capable of high speed. For Admiral Smith, the purpose of the new submarine, now called the Trident, was to launch missiles and remain hidden. Such an important mission, he believed, should not be trusted to uncertain new nuclear technology. But Admiral Rickover was adamant that the proposed submarine contain his nuclear propulsion design. The two squared off in front of the CNO, Admiral Bud Zumwalt, at a meeting at the Pentagon in 1970. The meeting had all of the three and four star admiral in the Navy, it seemed to me. The dispute was resolved at that particular meeting. Admiral Rickover challenged the CNO to make a decision then and there in favor of the high-speed Trident submarine. The decision was made and the Navy got in line and supported it. So we have committed as rapidly as we, as we can under the circumstances, aside from the... Then in 1973, the Navy had to contend with another challenge issued by the new Secretary of Defense, James Schlesinger. Schlesinger wanted to make the still unborn Trident missile accurate enough to be used against Soviet military targets, including missile silos engineered to withstand a nuclear attack. It was called counter-force strategy. What I designed was selective strikes. In the event that there was a massive invasion of Western Europe and forces of the NATO alliance were overwhelmed, at that time we would use selective strikes on Soviet territory from the United States as a way of bringing the Warsaw Pact offensive to an end through escalation. It would be a first strike with nuclear weapons against Soviet missile silos, a strategy the Navy historically had opposed. Counterforce was a source of tremendous uh, dispute and debate and controversy within the American defense establishment. Half perceived counterforce as the key to keeping the NATO alliance together. Half thought that counterforce was going to be the source of tremendous instability in a strategic nuclear relationship between the two superpowers and to be avoided at all costs. Ever since Admiral Burke, the Navy had seen ballistic missile submarines as general deterrence and assured retaliation to a Soviet first strike not as a potential offensive weapon. In addition, Admiral Smith claimed that the technology required for a more accurate missile didn't yet exist. So he and the Special Projects Office were hesitant about taking on the new mission. Secretary Schlesinger thought Smith's reservations had less to do with unavailable technology than with philosophy. He made the maximum use of that. He was reluctant to make the Polaris or Poseidon weapons more accurate because he thought that the politicians might be tempted then to use them. In this period, I explains why it was that I thought that in order to improve the overall U.S. deterrent that we must introduce greater accuracy 
I would say he demurred a bit, but there was no extended argument. Does that mean that they are an insubordinate organization uh, that is uh, somehow refusing to do what is uh, asked of it by their, their leadership? Um, that would be, I think, a significant overstatement. Right. Their view was that there were good technical reasons to be cautious about pursuing things like counterforce too aggressively. Outside the Navy, some were beginning to worry about the new direction of Trident. There was a desire for greater accuracy, the type of accuracy you don't need for mutual assured deterrence. There's a type of accuracy you would use if you were shooting at something that had to be destroyed. And that was the thing that finally got me to make up my mind to get out of that kind of business. Aldrich quit his job as a Trident missile engineer. Both he and arms control advocates worried that combining the accuracy of a new Trident missile with the invulnerability of a submarine might prove dangerously provocative. The Soviet Union and people who weren't on our side were always very nervous about what did we really have in mind. Uh, they would say that these are destabilizing. First strike is a, an aggressive capability. Counterforce, hard target capability, those are all aggressive. They are the opposite of deterrence. Admiral Levering Smith and Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger made a compromise. As a result, Smith began a program to develop a second generation Trident missile, accurate enough for counterforce. At the same time, he began upgrading existing Poseidon missiles to give them much greater range but without the big warheads that could be used against hardened Soviet missile sites. The upgraded missile, called Trident-1, was mated to existing Poseidon submarines and was deployed by the late 1970s. The larger, counterforce Trident-2 missile was left at the conceptual stage. We had the weapon systems at sea, uh, the, uh, the new capabilities, the improved accuracy and other characteristics that would come along when they came along. The Navy left counterforce to the Air Force, whose mission it was traditionally. The Air Force sought to upgrade its legs of the triad with a new bomber, the B-1, and a new land-based missile, the MX. Political pressure was intense. So the Navy has to upgrade to Trident. The the Air Force wants to upgrade to B-1, and of course, then you upgrade to MX on the land. And that's always your problem. You could never do one without doing all three, or it looked like you were favoring the service. However, in the wake of the Vietnam War, increased military spending in a time of budgetary restraint brought greater scrutiny for any new weapon system. At the expense of in 1977, President Carter and Secretary of Defense Harold Brown decided to move ahead on the Air Force's MX missile, but pulled the plug on the B-1. B-1 uh, would have been a more attractive option, probably, had it uh, been 30% less expensive. The Air Force turned all its attention to the MX, despite worries that land-based missiles would be vulnerable to a Soviet attack. But the Navy's missiles were invulnerable. As with Polaris and Poseidon before it, funding for the Trident program sailed through Congress. We to the Union. Until it hit a patch of rough seas. In the 1940s, we took the lead in creating the Atlantic Alliance. We met the Soviet challenges... By the late land. 1970s, President Jimmy Carter and an eager Congress had accelerated the production of Admiral Hyman Rickover's Trident submarine. But from the beginning, it was behind schedule and over budget. Trident had the misfortune of being a very large, very expensive nuclear weapons program at a time when any large, any expensive, any nuclear weapons program was going to be controversial. The Trident submarine was also the victim of a design battle between the electric boat company, its lead contractor, and Rickover. He was often accused by them of interfering and causing problems and causing delays. And uh, I attribute that to his increasing and continuing quest for excellence in construction and in operation. Admiral Rickover was a very senior officer, very powerful, if not the most powerful, person in the Defense Department, given the amount of autonomy he had. 
What do you think is the, is the, is the prospect then for nuclear war? Well, oh, I think we'll probably destroy ourselves. Trident submarine is developed in the midst of all of this struggle. In 1981, more than two years behind schedule and nearly $300 million over budget, the USS Ohio was finally commissioned with Admiral Rickover in attendance. The Ohio represents the latest commitment of the people of the United States to peace. While the Navy launched its first Trident submarine, the Air Force was still trying to make its MX missile invulnerable to a Soviet attack. Each MX missile will be confined to a single road network connected to 23 shelters. But success couldn't be guaranteed. After a variety of expensive and controversial Air Force proposals, the MX program was scaled back. So in 1983, the Reagan administration decided to finally move ahead with a larger, more accurate Trident II missile former Secretary of Defense Lessinger had envisioned back in the 1970s. We were called upon to actually improve the accuracy by a very, very substantial amount. In order to be able to assign to sea-based ballistic missile system targets which up until that time could only be covered by, by uh, land-based systems. Uh, ICBMs or, or bombers. The job of building the new missile, Trident II, fell to Admiral Ken Malley, the new head of the Navy Special Projects Office. In addition to building a larger, more accurate missile, Malley knew it also had to be reliable. My goal in those days was to make the Trident II like a Mack truck instead of an Indianapolis 500 racer, so if you hit a hard bump in the road, the thing is going to keep on trucking. We had a pretty good idea on how to build missiles and how they would work with one minor exception. That exception happened at the first underwater launch of a Trident II on March 21st, 1989. We went down to our launch depth to launch the missile and everything was going very smoothly. We heard from the surface vessel, missile broke, it's leaving the water. Missile ignition, missile away, and then all of a sudden, People were yelling, are you all right? Are you all right? Are you all right? And we kept saying, Wait, what's the problem? What's the problem? After a while, we got communication. And they told us the missile had done a triple loop. It went from joy for the launch that looked successful to all of a sudden, oh my goodness, what do we do now? It became a very sad day, very quickly. It was the first major failure of the Navy Special Projects Office since the early days of Polaris. Admiral Carl Trost was Chief of Naval Operations at the time. Accordingly, I foresee that many officers from these highly promotable... The public failure is always a disappointment and perhaps an embarrassment. Going before Congress any time you have a failure in the program is difficult. You do have to convince them of the viability of your program or you lose your funding for it. I was called over to brief some senators on the program. And I remember Senator Rudman came in. He seemed to be leading the... I guess I could call it an inquisition. They and he had. sat down and he said, well, good morning, Admiral. Thank you for coming over here. And he said, I want you to know that I'm a duck hunter. At which point I wondered, well, what does this have to do with my missile? And he said, well, duck hunters always shoot the wounded ducks first. And Admiral, you're a wounded duck with a wounded program. Mali fought for the continuation of Trident II's budget, promising several successful test launches by the end of 1989. Trident II hasn't misfired since. So more than 15 years after Secretary of Defense Lessinger ordered the Navy Special Projects Office to come up with a counterforce missile, Trident II finally became operational. When you think about the whole span of the story from Polaris to Trident II, it's only then that you see how different Trident II is in some ways from its predecessors, in the sense that Trident II really is the first uh, submarine launch missile that's designed from the beginning to be a counterforce weapon. The Trident II really is what fulfilled the promise of the Trident submarine. The Trident II was what was going to pack the punch. Today, Trident II and the Trident submarine are the heart of America's nuclear arsenal. The submarines silently patrol the world's oceans with missiles that can accurately hit any reinforced missile site. Today, 
no one thinks twice about the counterforce debate of the 70s. I don't think the issue of counterforce capability in Trident II is an issue in the Navy anymore. I don't think it has been for quite a few years. Because of reduced nuclear tensions, the U.S.'s total strategic force is scheduled to shrink. The Navy plans to retire four Trident submarines by the year 2004. President George W. Bush's administration has decided to outfit at least two of them for conventional service. A Trident submarine would be a wonderful a conventional deterrent. One of the attributes it has, which is very attractive to any future use, is its large volume and ability to carry large payloads. Uh, you could carry Tomahawk Strike missiles. You carry efforts to 60 SEALs. Their equipment, their small submarines. This is going to be a platform which is invulnerable and which has weapons against which there is no defense. The remaining Trident submarines will continue to patrol the waters as the backbone of America's nuclear deterrent force. I don't think the public has ever fully understood Trident because Trident isn't visual. Trident is, you go to sea, you don't see it, you don't hear about it. It's, uh, it's kind of out of sight and out of mind, you might say. It is by far and away the safest and most secure way to base our strategic systems. It has demonstrably been effective as a deterrent. The definition of deterrence is uh, different in different people's minds and, in fact, at different times in our history. I have to believe that deterrence works. This is a pretty good bird. It, uh, it's got a lot of range, a lot of accuracy, a lot of reliability, and it's going to take some new technology or something, some new political need to kind of change it. So I suspect it's going to be around for a long time. In fact, the Navy's fleet ballistic missile system has become a model for the entire U.S. military establishment. Building a 21st century military will require more than new weapons. It will also require a renewed spirit of innovation. The same spirit led Admiral Hyman Rickover in the 50s to the insight that the nuclear genie could be bottled to allow our submarines to stay underwater for months at a time. It led Admiral Red Rayburn to understand how to put a nuclear missile on a submarine. And it led Arleigh Burke, the father of the modern Navy, to have the foresight to put these two men and their ideas together to create the third and most invulnerable leg of our Cold War nuclear triad.